If in 1961 you had invested $1,000 in this man's company, today you would be sitting on $5 million. On Uncommon Knowledge, one of the signal figures in American business history, Charles Koch. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, Charles Koch studied at MIT, worked for a few years back east, then returned to Wichita to join his father's business, then a medium-sized oil company, in 1961. In 1966, he became president of the business, which he renamed Koch Industries in honor of his father. In the half a century since, Koch Industries has grown so dramatically that it now represents the second largest privately held company in the United States. Its products run from oil to polymers to paper products to pipelines to fiber optics, and it employs almost 100,000 people, 60,000 of them here in this country. Worth $21 million in 1961, Koch Industries, of which Mr. Koch remains chairman and CEO, is now worth $100 billion. With his brother David, Charles Koch is active in politics, funding think tanks and campaigns. Mr. Koch is also the author of a number of books, including most recently, Good Profit. Charles Koch, welcome. Actually, I ordinarily say welcome when we're in our studio, but you were kind enough to invite us into your home, so thank you for welcoming us here to your home in Indian Wells, California. Well, thanks for having me on your program. I've, I've watched it uh, a number of times, and I, I don't deserve to be on it, given the quality of the others, but uh, I take that as a high compliment, and I thank you for it. <laughs> All right, the opening gambit is modesty, then. We'll, we'll, from good profit, good profit is creating, this is the way you define your title, Good profit is creating superior value for our customers while consuming fewer resources and always acting lawfully and with integrity. Now, Charles, your common understanding of profit is money is money. What has integrity got to do with it? Well, it has to do uh, with this. It, now, if you want to make a quick buck, you can do it a lot of different ways. Uh, you can cheat somebody, you can uh, misrepresent something, you can uh, go manipulate the political system to get an advantage. But if you, wanna, if you wanna be successful over a long period of time, I believe you need to be, to focus first of all on creating value for others. And that's, an, oh, that's, I've had people, well, that's naive, that's uh, utopian. No, it isn't, because why will the customers want to pay you anything over a long period unless you're creating value for them? Why would your, your employees want to work for you? Or if they did, they didn't have any alternative. Why do they want to give their best efforts? Why do they want to get excited? Why would they wake up at night with ideas? If you're in a community, a plan in a community, unless you're creating value for that community, why would the community want you there if you're polluting and hurting people and not contributing anything to the community? So long-term success starts with being dedicated to creating value for others. It's, it's not altruism. It's, uh, my whole philosophy is, is to have a system of mutual benefit where both parties gain, a, a society based on win-win. All right. One of the aspects of good profits that's so interesting to me is that you provide something of an intellectual history. That makes it sound pompous. It's a very readable, enjoyable book, but that, you're talking about your own intellectual journey. Young man in Wichita, you go off to MIT, you begin reading, you try to figure life out. And as you're reading at MIT and during your few years as you're working back east, I'm going to quote you now the conclusions you reached. The more books I read, the more passionately I embraced the truth that widespread human well-being demands property rights, allows people to speak freely, refrains from interference in private parties' agreements and exchanges, and allows human action, that is markets, allows human action to guide prices." Close quote. 
So we've got the young man from Wichita embracing the Scotsman Adam Smith and the Austrian economists Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises. You find your way to classical liberalism. How did that happen? Well, it, it happened because uh, I, I discovered at an early age, I didn't think I was much good at anything. And, uh, but my father did bet me a big favor. He had me working in all my spare time from the time I was six, because he, he announced he didn't want his sons to be country club bums. He wanted us to feel grateful for everything and entitled to nothing. And, and for whatever reason. And when you say working, he didn't give you some cushy office job in the company. No, 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 not at, particularly at age six. I started out uh, digging dandelions. And when I say dig dandelions, you don't pull them out. You Gotta dig down and you have to get the entire root or they'll come right back. And I remember there was a, a club and a, and a swimming pool across the, the street from us. And I'm out there in 105 degree heat digging these and I could hear my friends, my little six year old friends, they're swimming and jumping off the diving board. And I could recognize each one's squeal was different of joy. And I'm thinking, why does my father hate me and their fathers love them? I found out that if you don't, and then, and then I of course graduated to shoveling out stalls and milking cows. And that doesn't sound like much work, but oh. it, it's, it's hard work. So I would milk cows before school and then again after school, or milk, or milk our cows and digging post holes and all these things. But I discovered that much later that if, if you don't learn to do dirty jobs, if you don't learn unpleasant work, you, by the time you're in your 30s, you never learn to work productively. And so he was doing me a, a huge favor. So it was beyond the work ethic. It taught you how to work productively and how to work with others in mutual benefit. For example, if a group of you are doing a dirty job, you don't try to stick it to them, make them do more, then they'll try to do it to you and the work goes on and on. You want to work together to get it done as efficiently as possible. You want to understand who your customer is. How do, what does my customer want? What, what does he value? I better do this the right way or I'll have to do it again. So you learn tremendous number of, of lessons in doing these, these dirty jobs. So that's, that was the starting point. And then I learned, I didn't think I was much good at anything and I didn't, and the other thing you learn is you don't want to do that the rest of your life. Right, right. So you better find some aptitude or something so you can do something that's more satisfying and fulfilling to yourself. It is not as unpleasant. So I didn't find much any good. And then in the third grade, I found the, the teacher was putting math problems on the board. And I asked, why is she doing that? The answer is obvious. Oh. And, I, and the, I, it wasn't obvious yeah. to the other kids. Right. Oh my God, I have an aptitude. So from then on, everything I did was the easy way out in that I'm gonna take more math and more science and logic and things that I'm good at and try to minimize having to do the things I'm no good at. So I went to MIT where the language is primarily math, not English, because I was so much better at math than, than English. And even though I took, got all these engineering degrees at MIT. By the way, it's worth noting, you, you got your undergraduate degree in engineering at MIT. You got a master's, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall, you got a master's in mechanical engineering. Nu nuclear engineering. Nuclear yeah. engineering. And then you got a second master's in Chemical engineering. Chemical engineering. So one, two, three MIT, right. MIT degrees in engineering. It's amazing you retain the facility to speak English. Well, after, that's, after that. that's true. Well, I had to, I had to relearn that. But, uh, but uh, even though I took all these engineering degrees, really what I maximized uh, my time on was courses in math and science. Right because I was much better th at that than the application of the principles. 
So, and that may be one reason I got one in nuclear engineering because it was mainly science. And, and then I, I, and I also thought it was a new field. This is the way energy is going to go. So there'll be entrepreneurial opportunities. And when I got in it, I realized because of all the safety concerns, it's going to be controlled by the government and it's not going to be. So I, I went back and, and got a degree in uh, chemical engineering. But you're saying your bent of mind was almost more theoretical than applied. It was, yeah, it was, it was. Pure it was math. in Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence is, is what, he, what he calls uh, logical mathematical intelligence. Okay. And he had, I, I didn't know Howard Gardner then or of him, but that I later learned that, that that's the particular aptitude I had. So, uh, so in the process, I learned that it's an ordered universe that the physical world is ordered and governed by certain principles. So I said to myself, well, if, I, if I'm going to be successful in the physical world, that is making technical innovations and, and learning how things work, I've got to understand the philosophy of science and the scientific method. So after I got out of MIT, I, that's, that was my fascination. I was, read everything I could on starting in Aristotle, Descartes, uh, uh, Popper, Kuhn, Polanyi, Einstein, Newton. I mean, that, that was my, my reading. And all this time, you're working back east for Arthur D. Little. I, Arthur D. Little, who, who in accounting and consulting. No, it wasn't what, accounting. What no, was Arthur it in those D. Days? Little is uh, was back then was uh, one of the leading full range consulting companies. And I started in product development, and then I then I got to move over to process development. And an interesting uh, project we had we, one client we had was the Chemical Core. And they had, uh, they had this idea that they would make aerosol bombs out of marijuana derivatives. And so I helped design the plant to make this, uh, this marijuana derivative that has 500, 500 times the potency of regular marijuana. And the idea was to put it, make, put it in a bomb and then rather with a hostile population, rather than go have to kill a bunch of people, you'd drop these marijuana aerosol bombs on them and you'd, they'd all be giggling and happy and you could come lock them up and everybody would, would be safe and peaceful. That's, I, I, I apologize, I, I misspent some of the ta taxpayers' hard-earned money in that one. But anyway, and then... I'm, I'm just, what I'm curious about is you're in the, you leave MIT and you get a practical job but your reading is all really quite, in other words, if I didn't know you were working at Arthur D. Little, if I just hear you talk about your intellectual interests, the reading you're doing, I'd say, oh, this is somebody who's working to become a professional academic. This is a professor in the making. Yeah. I, would, I would not have predicted that you'd go back to Wichita and take over the company. I'd have predicted that you'd have put yourself up in for a philosophy department, philosophy of science, and right now you'd be teaching at, you'd be teaching at MIT. Well, that's a matter of fact. That was my plan. I was first of all, I was I was thinking I'd get a PhD in math, and then I found out that, as smart as I thought I was in math, that when it got to really abstract math, it was beyond me. Like Norbert Wiener, who was a developer of cybernetics, had it uh, was teaching then, and only the very brightest math students would go to his class. No one had any idea what he was talking about. <laughs> So he would give everybody an A because he couldn't distinguish because they were all flunking his class and they were all the best students. So I knew I, I, I couldn't go there. So then I thought, well, I'll get, a, I'll get a doctorate in chemical engineering. And, uh, and I, I went to uh, one of my favorite professors and I said, well, what, what about this? He said, well, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to teach or be a researcher, yeah, but just keep in mind, we will make your life miserable. We'll have you do all our dirty jobs, make us look better, advance our careers, and you'll be kind of our, our slaves. So if that's what you want to do, you need to go through that. If you want to go in business, get the hell out of here as quickly as you can. So I went off and thought about it, and I said, well, I think probably logic and math will be helpful in business as well. 
And that sounds like a lot more fun. So I got this job at Arthur D. Little. And then, I, as I said, I started in product development. Then I did process development. And then I got over in management services. And great learning experiences because uh, we got to do consulting for uh, Standard Oil New Jersey, now Exxon, DuPont, Copper, Stanley Work, all these sizable companies. And here I was like 24, 25, and I'd go get to make presentations to senior management. So talk about learning English. Right, right. I had to learn some English <laughs> then to, to do this. So it was a great learning experience. And then after I'd been there about two years, my father calls me and, 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 and wanted me to come back uh, to work with him, and I turned him down because I was learning a lot, and I, I had no idea of going back. I mean, remember, he had been a tough taskmaster, and and he had uh, uh, he had worked me to the to the bone. I thought, and one of his favorite sayings, being Dutch, is you can tell the Dutch, but you can't tell them much. So, I thought, my God, I don't want to go back and get more of what I grew up under. So I said, thank you very much, but uh, I got different career paths. So a couple of months later, he called me back and he said, son, either you come back to run the company or I'm going to have to sell it because I don't have long to live and I have no successor. And he says, and I'll tell you what, our, our main company is a company called Rock Island Oil and Refining. We don't have a refinery. We have a crude oil gathering system. and." And we bought an interest in another refining company. And, but we have a separate business that you boys own. I put it in your name. It's a very small company, but it makes refining equipment. Called, it's called Coke Engineering. And it's not doing well. I haven't paid any attention to it. And I'll let you run that any way you want. The only thing you need my approval on is if you want to sell it. Now, I said, hey get to run it. So rather than consulting right. on people on how to run companies, I can go run one. And, and so you were how old at this stage? I was 25. Got it. And so I came back and, and it was wonderful. He was absolutely true to his word. He let me run it. And, and it was such a mess that I didn't know what I was doing. But even with the little experience I had, I could make great improvements in it and and it blossomed and so then he, he he turned over a lot of the other company and he actually made me president in 1966 as his health was really deteriorating and then he then he died in 1967 so I got to work with him for six years you before with he your died. dad for six years from 67 on you remain see you mentioned your siblings uh, at some point you and your brother David bought out your siblings' interest. Yeah. But you remain CEO of the company for what's nearly half a century now. That's Is right. Is that correct? Now, I want to return once again to good profit. I just read the way you had come to the conclusion that the best society was a free society, private property, freedom of speech, and so forth. Here's another quotation from good profit that continues that thinking. I'm quoting you. As I digested this, it dawned on me that these principles, principles of liberty, freedom, and so forth, are fundamental to the well-being not only of societies, but also of organizations, companies, which are essentially small societies, close quote. So I want to make sure I have this right. Coke Industries, this gigantic, enormously successful company as we see it today, Back in your mind, in the mind of young Charles Koch in the late 60s, your father's gone, now you're in charge, Koch Industries is an experiment. That's right. You get to test your beliefs about human nature on this company. That's right. That's I, correct? Oh, yeah. No, I had, when I was doing it, even, even when my father was still alive, I was trying these. But the, the way I, I came about this is... As I said, I was very interested in the philosophy of, of, of science, and, and, and I came across this essay of Polanyi's called The Republic of Science, and, in which he outlines how scientists work together to create the most innovation and advance scientific understanding. And a key part of that, well, one part is to get 
all kinds of, uh, of dispersed and desperate knowledge together. That's how you get innovations, when you have these conflicting ideas together and out of it comes something new. And another part is, which I also learned from Karl Popper, that, that the scientific method is to, is to articulate a, a, a theory that's refutable right. and then to spend as much time trying to disprove it as prove it. And, and, and he goes through what societies have done that and which ones, and those who, who apply this method that is free societies are those that pro progress and others like communist societies who have uh, uh, what's politically correct and don't allow other ideas to compete with it don't progress because they go down the, the wrong track. So I said, okay, we need this kind of challenge culture, this skepticism in our company. And so we're gonna build a culture of challenge that is if you're a supervisor at any level and your people don't challenge you, you've got to change your ways or you can't be a supervisor because you're not using the ideas of your people. You're not building a republic of science. And if you're an employee and you don't challenge your supervisor, then you're not doing your job. We, why don't we get another computer or a robot or something to do it because you're not using your brain. Let me, let me interrupt there because this gets us to what is the heart of much of good profit. You spend, as I say, almost half a century now working on, working on this experiment of Coke Industries right. and you've distilled your management technique into what you call man, market-based management, which has five basic components. Let's take a couple of those. You just touched on one. Knowledge, I'm quoting you again, knowledge processes. Not only is it permissible for employees at Coke to challenge their bosses if they think they have a better answer, but they have an obligation to do so. Absolutely. Close quote. Now in practice, I just said in the introduction, Coke Industries is now nine different freestanding units, 100,000 employees around the world, only a little more than half, 60,000 in this country, how do you diffuse this? I mean, here's the, here, you could just say, well, this is very high, high sounding that Mr. Koch, when he was a young man, developed this idea of that we needed challenge culture in our company. Terrific. But now we have a big company, processes apply, the usual bureaucrat. How do you resist that? How do you actually infuse genuine challenge culture across an entity as large as this? Well, I mean, it starts with, with values, and that's, that's our, the five dimensions are vision, virtue and talents, knowledge processes, you mentioned, decision rights, and incentives. And they're all based, as you say, from, from my studies on, on how people can best live and work together, how societies can organize themselves to maximize well-being for everybody, not just for a select few and so so the the starting point is is having these values what we call our 10 guiding principles uh, having them be who we are as a company many companies have lists of principles but in many cases they put them on the wall and that's the end of it stick them in the drawer and that's the end of it the, our principles are who we are as a company they guide everything we do they determine who we hire who we retain, who we promote, how you as employee will be rewarded, everything. And a key part of those values is, is or a key part of those principles is challenge. You've got to challenge and you've got to be skeptical and you've got to be committed to getting long-term results, not just results this quarter, but we evaluate and reward people on long-term results. And it's, I'm not saying it's easy or we're perfect. We're a long way from perfect in any of this, mm -hmm. but we fight it every day. But one of the most difficult things we have when we acquire a company is building in this challenge culture because in so many companies, if you challenge your boss, in particular if you're pushy about it, that can affect your career in a negative sure, way. Sure. And our, we're the opposite. If you never challenge, that's gonna affect your career in a ne negative way. If you challenge not to prove you're, you're a smarty pants or show up somebody,
but because you have an idea on how we can improve, how we can do better, how, the, how your boss's decision is a mistake. And if you do that, whether you're right or wrong, you're going to be celebrated and you're going to be rewarded for that, particularly, obviously, if it gets, improves results. Another of the, the uh, five tenets of market-based management, virtue and talents. And again, I'm quoting from Good Profit. We can hire all the brightest MBAs in the world, and if they don't have the right values, we will fail. We hire based on values first, then talent. That's breathtaking. It's breathtaking. Well, first of all, just as a practical matter, how do you screen for values? How do you screen for values legally? You're not allowed to ask questions about people's religion. How, how do you do that? How no, do you hire we're, based on we're values? We're not concerned about religion. We're, we're concerned about, do you have integrity? Do you have the courage to live by the values when they're tough? This is why Aristotle called courage the most important of all the virtues, because if you don't have it, you won't be able to exercise the other virtues when they're needed most. So courage, compliance, value creation, being dedicated to creating real value for our customers, for society, for the company, uh, uh, knowledge, challenge, treating others with dignity and respect, and then trying to have a job that's fulfilling to you because we find, and this isn't just altruism, this is the philosophy of mutual benefit. If an employee has a fulfilling job, they're going to more, be more creative and more productive, and it makes their lives better. Charles Koch, author of Good Profit. Thank you. 1961, the company is worth $21 million. Half a century later, it's worth $100 billion. Let me quote Good Profit. 1962, this is your second year at the company, was the year I began working to expand Rock Island's largest business, Rock Island, Island was then the name of the company, to expand the largest business, crude oil gathering. We aggressively, that word is important, I think, right. we aggressively bought crude oil trucks, trucking companies and pipelines, and we built pipelines where others refused to take risks. That's a word that's important too, risks. Right. Now, in much of good profits, you sound like a very calm, serene, rational processes guy, <laughs> which you'd expect from a man who has three degrees in engineering. Yeah. But here's a glimpse at somebody who thinks risk is important. And so what I'm trying to get at here is, what is your attitude toward risk? What is the company's attitude toward risk? To what extent do we owe this amazing growth of your company to intelligent, rational processes, and to what extent do we owe it to managers following your lead to take risks? Are you a good gambler? Well, I, I mean, you see what I'm getting at. You yeah, see what but, I'm getting but, at. But no, but the, this uh, this uh, MBM approach is not market based just management. Yeah, just one piece, and that'll work by itself. It's an integrated philosophy, and one, each of the five dimensions need to reinforce each other. And, uh, and for example, we, we do not take risks with safety or the environment. I mean, safety is, is job one, and, and if there's something not working properly at a unit, we say shut it down. For example, at, at Georgia Pacific, when we bought it, they had, their, their vision was to be the low-cost uh, upgrader of Southern Pine. And so the, the employees really bought into that. So if a machine, a paper machine, I don't know if you've ever seen a paper, they're big, huge and big, complicated, dangerous, complicated. Da very dangerous. The employees would tend to try to fix the machine while it's operating. And so they had a big accident rate. And we said, no, the rule, safety is first. Uh, saving people's lives, protecting uh, their health is first. If the machine is, you'd never work on it until it's shut down. This took years to get that through. We had to fire managers, fire employees who were violating this. But th that's how ingrained some of these mental models or ideas are. But we finally changed that. Every company we buy 
first thing we do is improve safety and then improve the environmental practices. So those are first. So we don't take risks there. Financial risks, we evaluate, okay, what's the probability of success? What's the downside? And then how does that compare to the upside? And, and part of the upside is not just the return on that investment, but will it build us new capability that'll be a new platform for growth? And when we say we took more risks than others, we, well, first of all, we, what we try to do is in crude oil gathering is understand it was mainly buying oil and transporting the oil of independent explorers and producers. So we, we got people to get to know each one. What do you value? What do you want? And then we'd give them maybe service. Well, we want to move our oil every day. We won't want any risk on, on you being late on your payments or not paying. It may be other things, whatever it was. Relationships are very important. Yeah, yeah. you okay. got to. And one of our, our top people said, you had this saying, if you don't know what's on your customers, what's posted on your customer's refrigerator door, you don't know your customer. Because if you don't have that close a relationship and that much trust in you, you really haven't built it. So that's what we... That was the first thing, to understand what our customers value so we could satisfy. And what we found out for most of them is, okay, you have a truck there, the, you, you have a truck ready, and if they get a discovery, you're there and you move that oil immediately. You, they don't have to call you, wait a week for the truck to get in. Then we found, okay, that's, that's a pain to have trucks coming in all the time. You gotta worry about the road, you gotta worry whether it's muddy or whether there's snow all these other things. So they want a pipeline in as quickly as possible. So before there were any economics in the field, you knew it was big enough to justify a pipeline, we would go in and we'd go in without any commitments. Just say, well, if, if we build a pipeline in there, will you sell us the oil to start with? 30 day division orders, they could cancel in 30 days. And we'll build these pipelines. And guess what? Since we did that, we're giving them good service. Somebody else would come in if the field got built and say, we'll build a pipeline and do it cheaper. They would give us last luck because they, they loved that we were committed to creating value for them and would do whatever it took to satisfy their values. That's why I'm coming back to right. if you're dedicated to creating value for your customers, you build loyalty. We have customers and suppliers that we've done business with for 40 years, and we try to help each other. If they're in a problem, rather than take advantage of them, I mean, we want to be compensated for what we're doing for them, and then the other way. And we've had some of these companies, I won't mention names, big companies say, we're the only company they have this kind of relationship with. Right, okay, so that story you just told from the financial point of view, building in a pipeline without knowing whether the field would be built out was a very risky thing to do. But from the point of view of creating value for the customer, I just don't know how you fit that. I'm trying to, th I, all, I have a terrible disability. I have an MBA. Oh so my when, God. So whenever you tell a so story you got some like brain that. brain damage. Exactly. I'm trying, <laughs> I avoided, I I'm avoided trying that. to figure out how the heck do you, this creating value, where does that fit in any matrix? That's. Got it. Okay. No, but we and we found from experience that ninety percent of those risks paid out, and they'd paid out. They pay out big time. Okay. You titled one chapter of Good Profit: Building with Stones That Fit. Quote: I often think of what we do as stone masonry. Once a stone has been carefully selected and set, it shapes a new space in which the mason can set yet another well-chosen stone. Okay, that's a beautiful image. On the other hand, how the heck does this work? L let's just take one example. I, I, I sure. keep saying you start in 1961, you've got crude oil gathering, and here we are in 2016, you've got nine different business units. Let's just take an example. One of your divisions, you mentioned Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific, great paper company. They've got some consumer products, unusual for, for most of the Coke line. That they've got actual consumer products, things you go buy in a grocery store. One of their lines is brawny paper towels. Right. Now, Charles, how on earth do you get 
from owning crude oil gathering operation to owning a company that makes brawny paper towels. How do you get these pieces? How do you know the pieces fit together? Well, that's, that, that's good. I mean, it's, it starts with this, this vision of creating value for others. Okay, so the first thing you ask yourself, okay, what are my capabilities that will create su superior value for others? And, uh, and, what, uh, and what are the, now f the best opportunities for me to do that? And then as I prove that, then, okay, if I add some other capabilities to the ones I have, what new opportunities will that open up for me? And so you, this mental model of driving creative destruction, of constant innovation, of always trying to build new platforms for growth, realizing that, uh, as Schumpeter said, the, the ground is, is always crumbling beneath the businessman's feet. So that was part of my studies, figuring this out. And so here, here's how we got there. After, uh, when, my, when my father was alive, he was worried he would, could die any time. And he died the way he wanted to. He was in a duck blind, shot the duck, and had a heart attack and died. That's I the mean, way to go. That was, that was wonderful for him. That's the way he wanted to go. But so then we, then we were able to negotiate his uh, estate tax. And so, so we were freed from that potential large liability. And so I looked at it, okay, we got three sets of capabilities. We've got uh, crude oil gathering and we'd build a trading business around that to trade crude oil because at times it was hard to sell. So we needed to build that capability. Then we had uh, the Coke engineering by this time I'd added a lot of other products and built that capability. So we had a, a thriving business there. So process equipment and that, that kind of, of thing. And then the, the third is we had this 35% uh, uh, interest in, in this refining company, the Great Northern Oil Company. So okay, one of my first job, first goals was to buy all of that company so we would have uh, uh, we would have a processing capability chemical, in the pro chemical process industries, and we could use that as a platform for growth. So I was able to, uh, to, to buy the rest of that, and that's, that's a long story, which I won't go into. Uh, but So we, bu I, we bought that, and then, then we started building that, improving that refinery, and it was like 40,000 barrels a day. Now it's over 300,000 barrels a day. So we built that, and then we used that capability to buy a refinery in Corpus. We also had a chemical plant attached to it. So then we built that, and we started building uh, the chemical business, and we started buying other chemical businesses, and then we bought DuPont's uh, uh, Lycra and Nylon business which in, in part was a, a forward integration of what we had at, at Corpus. And then we were saying, okay, we've been successful in all these different chemical process industries. What other chemical process industries that have similar requirements? That is, you using chemical process uh, technology, and we've gotten really good at optimizing plants. They have diverse raw materials and a diverse group of products, so we need to optimize the whole system. We've built trading capabilities for doing the best job of supplying and logistic capabilities and delivering, understanding what our customers value. Then in Investa, we had gotten consumer products with them, like- uh, Investa is a company you purchased in, I can't remember the year. In, in, uh, in 2004. All right. And uh, and they did, uh, they had uh, they had some consumer uh, brands like uh, like Lycra and like Stainmaster Carpet, and so we so we learned we learned we developed some capabilities. So we looked at that as a new platform for growth. So we said, okay, the pulp and paper industry is a chemical process industry. So we're going to look at that, and we did some small experiments. And then we heard that Georgia Pacific wanted to become more of a consumer products company and get out of some of their commodity businesses so their, their, their multiple would go up and their, their stock price would go up. 
So we approached them about buying their pulp business, and we made a deal to buy that, and we applied our management philosophy to it, made some substantial improvements. So we went back to them with the idea, why don't they divide the company? We'll buy all the non-consumer products business. Their multiple will go up, and the combination will be a much higher value for their stockholders. And they said, boy, we, we like the value, but we have all these asbestos liabilities, and it would be considered fraudulent tra transfer if we broke the company up because the, the, uh, the lawyers want the full asset base right. to, to pay off these liabilities. So we took a deep breath and we said, okay, you like the value, why don't we just buy the whole thing at this value? And they said, okay. So you know, we bought the whole thing, and it was it was a huge deal for us. And but it's been great. We've our, our stuff works. And the, by the way, with the way we look at acquisitions is we want several benefits. We want to believe that our management philosophy will substantially improve their business. We want them to have capabilities that we don't have, so we can create new platforms for growth. So we want it to be win-win, one hand wash the other. It isn't just we take it over and tell them how to do. Right. No, we right. merge the two sets of capabilities to create more value. Charles, half a century of growth, where did all the capital come from? You are still a privately held company. You did not buckle under at any point and go to the public markets. Yeah, I don't think we would have been able to do. I mean, first of all, who's this? kid that has all these crazy theories and is going to use our company as a laboratory. I mean, I'd have been fired long ago because we had lots of, of missed starts and You had and one failures. choice, own it or lose your job. That was it. That was it. And so, uh, so staying private. So the way we did it, and fortunately we had a small number of shareholders, so we could reinvest 90% of our profits in the business. And so that gave us the, the capital to continue to do that and still pay out enough so our stockholders had all the money they needed. And they had enough confidence in it that we could get a higher return on, on their capital than if we paid it out in dividends uh, that they could get. When. Last question about this 50 years of growth. Uh, you're a private company, not a public company, but for, you surely are aware of this concept of a conglomerate discount where the market values conglomerates, public conglomerates, at less than the sum of their parts. And the thinking, very common thinking, is that a big diversified company, such as Coke, for example, uh, just can't manage as effectively as a company that focuses on one tight industry, one tight grouping of products, uh, Jeff Immelt at GE just got rid of, Jeff, between Jack, Jack Welch and right. Jeff Immelt, you get a narrowing of, of GE's products, the markets right. they're in, and so forth. So how do you, you've got these nine industry groups, you're a stonemason, and that stone, that beautiful stone edifice that you've built is a conglomerate. You've got a, just a, an enormous different number of products and industries that you're in. How do you beat that, that tendency for a diffusion of management energy, for, for a lack of focus? How do you beat the conglomerate discount, so to speak? Well, see, we, we, don't, uh, we don't look at it. Every, every business we've gone into is, was based on our having the capability to improve it, and their having capabilities to open new opportunities for it. So one hand washes the other here. And all of these businesses are interrelated and work with each other. And, and we, have, uh, we, we tr try not to have big central bureaucracy, but what we have is a few uh, specialists in each field. For example, in innovation, we put on uh, twice a year innovation sem seminars. So all the people involved in product or process innovation get together and share ideas on, on innovation and driving radical innovation, driving creative destruction. And, uh, and we bring in speakers and they share knowledge and then they build a community. This is the Republic of Science. 
So then when they have a question on this or that, they know who to call. And we do the same thing on operations excellence. So like most of our businesses are chemical process industry. So they have similar problems. So they share knowledge from that. So each one isn't reinventing the wheel. So your core competency, you do have a core competency. You do have a focus and it's the Republic of Coke. It's the, the intellect, it. it's the set of ideas, it's this, and these the, management and the techniques values. and the values. The values come first, and then, then particular technologies and techniques come later. But the techniques and the procedures aren't valuable unless people understand the underlying principles. For example, incentives. They say, how do you do incentives? Well, we try to evaluate each year, how much each employee has contributed to increasing the long-term value of Coke Industries, not just this year's earnings. Have you helped improve the culture? Uh, have you built additional capabilities that don't, haven't paid off this year but w are promising for the future? We look at that whole thing. So our, our incentive isn't, incentives aren't based on a formula. They're based on some objective measures but largely they're subjective. And, and we spend a tremendous amount of time on this and we're not perfect. We measure with a micrometer and then cut with an ax because, <laughs> be, because you can't really know. But we do it well enough that our people know that we're using our best efforts to reward them for the value they're creating. And not just for their business, but for the overall. For example, if you had an idea, you're working in, uh, in Flint Hills, our refining and chemical. If you had an idea that helped Georgia Pacific or helped Invista, we're, that's, gonna be, oh, that's gonna be in the evaluation. And even if it didn't help them that year, what we believe it'll help them for the future. All right. From the Republic of Coke to the American Republic, you and your brother, David, have been active in supporting free market, libertarian think tanks, candidates, political causes. This has been going on for years. You helped found the Cato Institute in 1977 is right. when Cato was founded. And, uh, and in recent years, you've devoted large sums of money to political causes. Now, you get beat up in the press for this all the time. Right. Senator Bernie Sanders campaigning for president, crisscrosses the country, naming you and your brother by name as bad guys. Right. Charles, let me clue you in on something here. <clears throat> Here's the way it's done. You retain a good lobbying firm in Washington quietly. You run the money through the corporation, not from your personal accounts. You get what you need done to get the legislation and the regulation that you need to increase your profits, and you keep your name out of the press. Now, why can't you see that? I see that perfectly, and that's called corporate welfare, and that's one of the things that's destroying our country. Our, well, we don't look at it that way, and uh, I mean, we're as you can, as you've been pointing out, we're or I'm quite idiosyncratic in my approach to things, and that's true on politics. We don't look at policies on whether it's going to make us more money or not. We look at it, will this help people improve their lives or will it make their lives worse? And, and I see the biggest problem in the country, and I've complimented Bernie Sanders on this. Oh, yeah, I'd like to get to this, that in a moment. Yep. Is, that, is that we're in an increasingly becoming a two-tiered society that's destroying, uh, destroying opportunities for the disadvantaged and creating welfare for the wealthy. So the primary issues we're working on, one uh, is criminal justice reform. Uh, another is, uh, is improving the education system, particularly, well, all through K through 12 and universities, uh, not only in policies, but in supplementing it. And we have a number of organizations that do that then in creating more of an open economy so people who have nothing have the opportunity to get jobs, get started, and, and, and create well-being and meaning in their lives. And then that's on the one side. And then on the other side, to oppose all corporate welfare, all benefits. 
And we, the, uh, the analysis we've seen is that this corporate welfare is costing the economy probably at least five trillion a year out of a 15 trillion economy. For example, the tax code alone has one and a half trillion of special benefits and exemptions in it. And so, so we oppose all of that. And we think, no, get, look, uh, as you know, this country was in theory founded on the idea of every human being has rights, unalienable rights, and there should be equal rights. And because it, the country, this country applied it a little bit, it became the most prosperous country with the greatest well-being of any in the history of the world. But this was unique. All other countries were founded on the divine right of kings or the emperors of God or the rulers have all the rights and the people have none. Now the tragedy in this country, which is haunting us today, is that wasn't fully applied. Like it was not applied at all for blacks and Native Americans. They weren't even considered fully human. They had no rights. So this has created a huge disaster in this country. Then women only had partial rights and certain Im immigra immigrants such as the Chinese and the Irish and, and others only had partial rights. And then this idea of corporate welfare, we had this in the beginning, those who had an inside track got special deals. So just think if this country had been founded in a way that was true to the Declaration of Independence, what we could be. And that's my ideal for the future. I think if we can move in that back to where we should have started from, we could, we could create the, the greatest society, a better society than anyone ever dreamed of. Charles, let, so that's, that's cool. my no, dream. So here's, here's, here's the argument. I just have to put it to you. This is from the, uh, here's the argument. I said you get beat up in the press all the time. Here's a recent, from a recent article in the New York Times. Quote, the Koch brothers and a small number of allied plutocrats, you can tell he's not on your side if <laughs> you're talking about your friends as plutocrats, have essentially hijacked American democracy using their money not just to compete with their political adversaries, but to drown them out, close quote. This notion that somehow you're too wealthy that because you're as wealthy as you are, you have too many resources. It's unfair for you to weigh in in politics because you just have more than others. How do you handle that? Well, I, I, I mean, look at the, at the money that we raise that goes into politics, which, uh, I mean, we, we have a budget this year of, let's say, 500 million for all our activities. The great majority of that goes for education, for this new organization we're building called Stand Together, which works with uh, these, these group who try to improve the lives of disadvantaged people, particularly minorities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that's so exciting that if we can really help uh, uh, these people expand their, their capabilities. Uh, and, and, uh, and then in, in think tanks, getting the ideas out, p pushing for better policies, and, and just a fraction goes into electoral politics. As a matter of fact, I have said, okay, we're gonna raise, let's say we, over the two year period, we raised 750 million total. I've been saying that probably 250 in that will go in politics, but because of our disappointment in the primaries that, I think it'll be significantly less than that. Can I, can I, and, when you, but our total will be about the same because there's more interest in these new things from our donors. Okay, uh, let's just take a moment to explain that. So when you say you're raising money, you and your brother put in substantial resources yourselves, but you've, at this stage, you've uh, put together a network of something like 300 or so like-minded yeah, individuals. Four, four to 500. Four to 500. People, you have your conference each year. There's a discussion yeah, about what the two, priorities two a are. Year. Two a year. Okay. I just wanted to make clear that when you say yeah. you raise money, you are raising money as well as putting in. Your oh own yeah, resources. the great majority of 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 what we 
uh, invest or help invest is uh, coming from others. Okay. So I want to come to the current, the, your disappointment in the primaries and so forth in a moment. But to look at the, to look at that quotation I gave you the other way around, the New York Times piece that I quoted says, oh, it's in some way it's illegitimate for wealthy people to get in. There's another way that that might be looked at, and it's just the other way around. And the way it might run is something like this, that people who have benefited from the free market system have some responsibility to defend what they, they have experience of it, they can see its shortcomings, corporate welfare would be one in your case, but people, people in your position have something of a responsibility and the surprise is not that Charles and David Koch have put together several hundred friends and like-minded people. The surprise is that there aren't more people. You can think Charles Koch, David Koch, Rupert Murdoch, Clifford Asnes, uh, Sean Field. You, you don't have to go very much beyond the fingers of two hands to think of prominent business leaders who take seriously American politics and are willing to speak under their own name. Why is that? Well, I, I think the, well, first of all, I, I feel uh, a more, just as you say, I feel a moral obligation to do this. And I feel I have a, talk about a calling. Uh, I have a calling to, to do this. Unfortunately, uh, the, the other parts have been effective. Like I, I, when I started in this, I started in education because I wanted, as I said, other pe this, I, these ideas were transforming my life. And I wanted to give as many other people the idea, that, the, the opportunity to transform their lives. And then I could see that, uh, that the, many of the policies were, were holding people back from fully applying these ideas to make their lives better. So we started working on on moving, trying to move uh, America towards policies that will enable everybody to practice these as opposed to where I saw us going to a system of, 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 uh, of control, dependency, cronyism, and poverty that isn't creating this system of, of mutual benefit and general well-being but a system that's pit, pitting individuals and groups against each other. And, and then we, we got into electoral politics because I was very disappointed in, in what the Bush 43 administration was doing. They grew the government much more than Clinton and, and even on the regulatory, they supposedly deregulated. The, the regulations that they added were more than double what it was under Clinton. And so we, we, we got started in the political side uh, in that administration to oppose what they were doing. It was a little hard because most business people are Republicans and they say, didn't want to oppose a Republican. Let it be noted that the people who got you so ticked off you entered political, became politically active were Republicans, yeah. not Democrats. Well, and, and I'm, I still feel that way and, and um, the whole American population evidently feels that way. That's why they're going against the Republican politicians. So, which brings us to the current primary season. Here's another question I have to ask. We've talked about business leaders who are willing to do something, and there's one, and his name is Donald Trump. What do you make of him? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't like to comment about uh, individuals because we're not into ad hominem attacks, but I, I can say this, I disagree with a lot of his policies, as you can tell from what I, uh, how I've been articulating what we stand for. And I've said this uh, public before, I don't believe in protectionism. I don't believe in corporate welfare. I don't believe that, I, I believe in free speech. I don't believe in attacking, personally attacking people who disagree with you. And you see, I don't do that. I praise Bernie Sanders, he's yes. attacking us. I praised him publicly and we made a video praising him. And it was interesting then, he and Hillary got into, in one of their debates, into a big conflict over our supposedly supporting Bernie Sanders, which was wonderful. But uh, to be clear, you support, you agree 
with his diagnosis of what's wrong with the country, yeah. you think he's completely wrong oh, about yes, expanding solution. government to, to solve yeah, the problem. Yeah, they'll just okay. make more go down this path further, which is, which is destroying people's lives and making the country worse. A few final questions. Uh, the future of Coke Industries. One, one about the future of Coke Industries and one about the future of the country. Just two last questions. One final time, let me quote this book, Good Profit. Thank you. Good f going forward, Coke's vision is to double profits on average every six years. Double profits on average every six years. That implies a growth rate of about 12%? 12%, yeah. And see, I told you I have an MBA. Yeah, that's good. You, <laughs> you could have gone to MIT. 12%. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's more than six times the rate at which the American economy has grown pretty much year in and year out since 2008. Do you put that in here as a purely aspirational matter, or do you really believe this company, which is already worth $100 billion and employs 100,000 people, can continue to grow its profits at 12% a year? Well, uh, we, we can only do that at, at certain times, and that's not uh, like I'm, I'm assuming and pushing our people to have uh, an even slope up. Where we've grown, we've been flat for a while, and then we get a new opportunity, we jump up, and then we're flat for a while. So that doesn't mean every six years, but that's why I say on average, I see. over 50 years. And but there's still room for growth in your mind. Oh yeah, but, but we've, we've got to find new platforms for growth, and that's, that's why we bought Molex, and, we're, and we're, we have a lot of other investments in, uh, in information technology. And, uh, and our goal is to, is to turn all our products and processes into smart products and processes. For example, at a, we, we operate a lot of plants that, that are, are dangerous, either because the, 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 some of the, the raw materials or the intermediates are toxic or because they're explosive. So you have what's the technology today, somebody with a sniffer, a detector walks around to see if there are any of these. We're working on, on a process that will have monitors everywhere and will automatically not only detect it, but shut the unit down. I mean, that's, that's a smart product and processes. Then we, Georgia Pacific's working on the bathroom, the public bathroom of the future, which will be cleaner, use lower energy, uh, not run out of, of anything, and so on. So we're working on that everywhere, and so, and then we're, we're broadening uh, Molex's uh, product lines to enable us to better do this, so it'll benefit them and our other companies. Once again, it's win-win. It's how the different pieces fit together. And then we're doing the same thing in biotechnology. I said I had, I had one more question, but I actually have... This just occurred to me. It's been a long time, Charles, since you had anything to prove to anybody. And you've just turned 80. It's been half a century of building this company. And yet everybody I talked to in your organization said, oh no, Mr. Koch is still putting in nine hour days. Well, it's much more than that. That's just at the office, come on. <laughs> No, I go home and work out and have dinner, and then I work some more. Well, what are you doing? Look, there's a golf course right outside your window here. Yeah, and I might play one day a week or one day every other week. But truly, what keeps you at it? It's, uh, well, I, I take what, uh, what, what Shakespeare said, that uh, that's what's won is done. Uh, joy's soul is in the doing. So, I mean, it goes with, with Maslow and the psychologists, what they've found. The, what, what gives you fulfillment and long-term happiness is accomplishing something. And they find that if you accomplish something and then that's it, what are you just gonna brag about you did that? It's like somebody got, got a PhD and that's, that's their high point in their life. They're just gonna sit at rest on their laurels, no. You become very unhappy, become bored. What you've got to do is keep growing and learning and finding new ways to, to contribute. That's the way you feel good about yourself. All right, now my final question, the future of the country. I, I'm quoting now from a column 
your column in the Chicago Tribune in which you said, I agree with Bernie Sanders. You agree with his diagnosis of that, that was in no Washington Post. I'm sorry, the Washington Post. Yeah. Quote, so I'm quoting that column. It is results, not intentions that matter. History has proven that a bigger, more controlling, more complex and costlier federal government leaves the disadvantaged less likely to improve their lives. Close quote. History of the Soviet Union proves that. It was a failure. Right. History of many of our own social programs. You yourself noted in that column that since President Johnson declared war on poverty in 1964, we spent $22 trillion on poverty, and the poverty rate hasn't budged barely right. a percentage point. So here is the question. All of that evidence that big government is a problem, particularly for the poor, and yet in a recent poll, this is in Iowa, during the, leading up to the Iowa caucuses, 43% of Democratic Iowa caucus goers, and a, most the larger largest percentage among young people called themselves socialists. Called themselves socialists, despite it all. Are you optimistic about the future of this country? Well, we've got to change the the narrative, and we've got to learn to do a better job of communicating what makes people's lives better, what will give them happy, fulfilling lives. And it's, as you pointed out, it's not socialism. And, and now this is what they're getting from almost all the media at almost all universities and schools, that this, this socialism is good. So, but fortunately, there's technology there. There's alter, alter, alternative media, and there are more and more groups that are realizing that this is a dead end. And so what we're trying to do in our network is reach out and innovate, drive creative destruction in this area, find new and better ways to show people this is a dead end for you. The way to live a better life and have a more moral society is to go away from this system of control and dependency and perpetual property. Charles Koch, author of Good Profit, thank you. Thank you, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.